It's your boy Mike Measy, aka Michael Marshall. I'm here with Thizzler, and it's going down. Follow the link down there. A second chance, because the first time around, I wasn't included in it. Um, all the success from I Got Five on it, uh, they missed me with it. They, they, no calls. I've never performed that song with Yuck or Numb or anybody. Uh, the night that they invited me to the video shoot, no one was there but me. That's why when you see me in the video, it's just me and the, the strippers for just a second. Um, so it's like a second chance. I missed it financially at the beginning, but now uh, paperwork has been in place since 2005. Uh, that's when I got sober. So the paperwork that I had tucked, that I didn't really know what it was, I gave it to my wife and she figured it out. So we got it all lined up. So now that... Um, it's being used in the movie, that's going to give it like a, uh, another real run. And since I missed the money on the first run, I'm here now. So this money should be bigger because movies generate more um, tallies, for lack of a better word, uh, when it comes to publishing. I mean, I got five on it, did maybe three million albums. So that's just three million tally counts. But this movie, you know, it could be seen by 200 million people. And publishing works the same way it works with the record. We get talents for each one of those. So that's good for me. And then the, the thing that I think is the main thing is that people can get to know who I am. Um, I just, I've always found it weird that the generation that's been listening to I Got Five on it have just listened to it and not really wondered who was singing it. Because when I was younger, we would really be in the back of these records looking at uh, credits and all that, trying to figure out who was doing the thing that we liked the most. And it's clear that my voice is the biggest and most important thing on the track. So I was always thinking that people would go and search that out, but they haven't. So thank God, Jordan Peele, he's younger than me. So when he was younger, he probably was vibing to that song, getting high to the song and the whole shit, just like everybody else does. But he took a chance with it and put it in a movie, which is going to be big. Now, he's using it in a horror movie, so... It wasn't expected, because it's a song about putting your money together to go get some weed. If you ain't got five on it, you can't get high on it. But Jordan is, he's pulling on the, the, the creepy, haunting aspect of the melody. And the melody is written by me. So I can feel what he's saying on that. So I'm excited about it getting a second run, me getting monetarily taken care of, and introducing myself to the world, because uh, I've been out here for you know, I've been doing this since the 80s. 86 was the first hit that I had uh, with Rumors in the Timex Social Club. And then again in 96, we did I Got Five on it. So it was like every 10 years I had a song that was on the radio. Because around 2006 or seven, I did a song with San Quinn. Uh, I had him feature on a song for my album. And he took it and put it on his album and, and made it like it was a feature of me. So my name didn't really get pushed by the radio when they were playing So Young, So Sweet. Um, it's always been like that here in the Bay Area. They, they don't really show support until somebody else shows support and then it swings back. That's what happened with Rumors. Rumors was broken and turned into a hit in Houston at K-Day by a lady named Terry Avery's. And then it swung here in the Bay Area got it. But the first time that anybody heard it, we played it here in the Bay Area. My whole high school knew that song. So when it swung back, everybody knew it. But that's just how the Bay is. So I'm excited that I'll get another chance, and this is bigger than just the Bay. This is a worldwide movie. And I know people know my voice all over the world because I went over to Germany when the song got to its highest point here, but it was number one over there. And Yuck and Numb and Chris Hicks, they wasn't going to be able to leave the country to go to Germany. Uh, you know, they were young hustlers, so they definitely had legal issues. And Chris Hicks is a gangster, so I don't think he was going to be able to to leave and get over there. He didn't know how to talk to people anyway. So anyway, I was the one who went over there to do that. So I know, the whole world knows that. They know it and they sing it. And that's the part that they sing, the I Got Five on it part. I didn't turn the paperwork in because I didn't understand that it was something I needed to turn in. I thought me having that meant that they were gonna be sending me checks. Not fully understanding it, still kind of young. Um, so when I get clean and sober, I get married, and my wife is going through all this paperwork that I have, and she finds that, and she asks me what it is, and then I realize, I was like, oh, I think this is the, 
the publishing points for, I got five on it. Oh, okay. So we go to a lawyer, real powerful lawyer, right? A, 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 a family friend introduced me to him. Uh, so we're going in there to let them know that BMI doesn't have my percentage on their website. So they're not sending money to me, they're holding it because they don't know where it's supposed to go. But legally, they know that there's 10% that belongs to someone else. So we get the lawyer to speak to BMI about it, and, they, and BMI tells us, okay, so we're not going to go back to pay you, but we'll start paying you from right now. So I'm talking to my lawyers, and I'm doing research, and come to find out there is no statute of limitations when people owe you money if they've never sent you an invoice. BMI, Universal, uh, CNO Records never sent me an invoice telling me we have money for you, come get it. Because if they had, after seven years, if I didn't come get that, it's all good, it's for them. But since they didn't, they were supposed to put that to the side and let it collect interest, give me my portion, and then they get to keep the interest. But BMI is gangsters, just like all the rest of these capitalistic companies, and they were like, we're not going back that far. And my lawyer was like, okay, so uh, the bad part is uh, it's a conflict of interest because we work with them too. You came to us about something that wasn't going to be uh, litigious with them, and we took care of that. But if you want to get litigious with them, we can't do it. So I gave up on that, and uh, I was resigned to getting the little bit that comes every year from I Got Five on it. You know, something maybe 15000 a year, something like that. So that was gonna, I was going to be content with that, but at least I was getting it now, right? But then when this came out, I was like, oh, my God, this is the second chance. My paperwork's turned in. I got 10%. And now they're sending me sync release releases. And ever since the movie, I mean, I've got a whole bunch of them. I don't know if I'm able to talk about them, but it's going to be, I got five and it's going to be in a lot of places coming up soon, not just that movie. But yeah, so the, the legal paperwork stuff has always not been right because the people in power, uh, I've heard people say, look, the new artists that come, if they don't know, it's not our job to tell them. It's their job to learn it and then do the same thing to the next artist that they bring. So they're actually like doing like this crazy cycle of just straight fuckery, just constantly fucking young cats and then sending those young cats into their older age and making them want to fuck over younger cats. It's cyclical, cyclical and it's, it's crazy how the industry is. But now the paperwork is all, all good. I wish I could go back and correct the rumors once because it's going to come a time when they're going to need that, too. And I'm trying to do a movie, and I'm, so I'm trying to tell the story of both those songs. So I wish I can get the publishing back for that. But Yeah, that was in the 80s, right after high school. We were in a um, mixologist club, after-school club. And uh, that's how we all met, listening to records and stuff like that. And uh, I graduated in 83, me and my buddies. And I started going to Laney, and I was taking a piano class. So Marcus is always writing lyrics, right? He's got a hell of lyrics written down, taped on the walls and shit like that. Um, and all the time, you know, me and my boys, we'd be laughing, like, what are you doing? What, what, what you, you want to sing? You, you trying to do music? Blah, blah, blah. We just DJs. We're not tripping on that. But uh, one day I'm playing around in the house on my Casio, little white Casio. I'm playing this melody that I been learning at school. And basically the melody is from Michael McDonald's, I keep forgetting, I'm not in love anymore. Now if you look that up, you'll recognize that the, uh, the, the music in the bass line is So I just took that and Anyway, that was rumors. So I'm playing that music and he likes it. So he's like, try these lyrics over that. And it took a while because I'm not used to singing lyrics. I never really sang any new song. I would sing things that I heard playing over and over and I would sing them, right? So we finally get the cadence and all that stuff right and then we sing it and record it and we're kind of digging it. So then there's a talent show at our old high school 
And I used to sing in all the talent shows, right? So now that I'm graduated and I'm at junior college, I'm trying to get in that talent show. So they say, you know, you can't be in a talent show. You're not in high school anymore. I was like, well, can I, can I, can I come and just, just do a song when, and, and I won't even have to be in it. I just really liked singing because that's all I did. I was singing in the choir, singing in the hallways, singing in class, singing in detention, I always getting in trouble because I was singing all the time. There's always melodies and I can't stop this stuff and the clicking of the teeth and it was crazy. So they, she, the lady who's in charge, Miss Bennett, Thalette Bennett, she says, why don't you guys come and do something uh, as the judges are tallying the votes for the other acts? So we say, okay, so we take that song and me, Marcus Thompson, Greg Thomas, and Darian Cleage, along with my boy um, Craig Samuels. We go up there and we are pretending that we are the time. That's where that name came from. So we're supposed to be comedy relief, so let's change everything. It's not the time anymore, it's Timex. And it's the Timex Social Club. Marcus came up with that, I don't know. I had never heard the phrase social club before, but apparently there's a bunch of them in the Bay Area and other um, places in, a, uh, in, in America. Uh, and it's like um, a clubhouse or a, a group where people come together. So he put those two together and then we went up there and we were supposed to be um, Morris, Morris Day and Prince and Jellybean Johnson, all those guys, but we changed the names a little bit. But anyway, we do that song from tape and we just up there with fake guitars and one dude's got drumsticks. and We just having fun. Them kids love that shit. And one of the grown-ups who worked in the um, Black History, no, African American Studies Department. I am so sorry, Dr. Navies. The African American Studies Department was uh, Charles Douglas. He went to Cal and he was studying rhetoric up there. So he was a TA with Mr. Navies. So he also um, had this after-school program where he was trying to, I don't really know what he was trying to do, but there was always people who had talent in this room, so I, I would come by and he got to know me, and so then I told him about that song, so he heard it and he really liked it, so he took a copy of it that we put onto a four-track tape on vacation during the summer, and he said he was going to take and let some of his folks listen to it and see what they thought about it. We didn't think twice I didn't think twice about that. I didn't trip. Um, so he did, and when he came back, he's like, we need to record this, and I think I got somebody who might be uh, willing to do that, and that's how we met Jay King. Jay King is a boogaloo dancer from Vallejo by way of Sacramento, right? And Jay King looks so, so weathered and leathery I thought the man was in his 40s. So I, always, I thought it was weird at the time that this old man was really into this young song that we was doing, but he was. So he put the money up, about 2,500 for us to go for two blocked out sessions at Starlight Studios in Richmond, 12 hours each. One was to delay the music and one was for me to sing. And that's what we did. I went in there and you know, first it was everybody trying to sing including Jay King, but then the people that he brought to help lay the music down and co-produce, is what they would call it, they, they, they talked him into getting out of there, out of the booth, and just let me do it. And that's how we got rumors, because uh, we pressed that up, and we had a record, and we were excited about it. Uh, and of course, the punk-ass radio here in the Bay Area, it was KMEL back then, they wasn't, they wasn't no, KSOL, they wasn't going to play us. Um, and they didn't. But like I say, that song ended up, because it's vinyl, uh, ended up out there in Texas, in Houston. And Terry Avery's of K-Day, she liked it and she played it and broke that record. And it took off in Houston and then swung back to Cali. Because that's how radio works. Whatever station is playing something that's getting a lot of spins and attention, other places are trying to do that too because now this radio station is able to sell more advertisement more companies want to spend money with them because they figure more people are listening because you're playing a song that seems to be climbing the charts. So all the radio stations and PDs coming back towards the West, they jumped on it. So like one day we just, I don't know where we were, but that song comes on the radio and I mean, we lose our mind. We can't believe it. It's unbelievable. Again, we're DJs. Now we got our own record to play at our parties and it's going to be lit and we pumped and all that. 
But after that, it all just started going downhill. That guy came from Daniel Records, and because Jay King was acting crazy, you know, he came to us under the auspices, and I'll get your money from Jay King. Uh, I'll fix whatever that problem is. Don't worry about it. By the way, you guys wanna you guys wanna open up for Run DMC? They're gonna be here at the Coliseum next weekend. I got the pool. Man, that's all he had to tell us. He had a hook, line, and sinker. We went and we did that show. Usually you gotta buy on to a to a tour if you're unknown. But we had the biggest record in the country at the time. Bigger than Adidas, bigger than L O Cool J shit, bigger than Houdini's. You can go look that up. Billboard. Rumors was at the top of the charts. So they had us on, because the Beastie Boys were on this leg, so they needed somebody to fill the spot, so they got us. So we did the one in Oakland. The PD of the tour, he had a bright idea, why don't we take these guys on this whole southern leg that we're about to do? Uh, so he's talking to one of the guys um, who's on the stage with us performing. He's not like in charge, but he's one year older than the rest of us, but he kind of has the that devious kind of mind of, oh, this is money, I, yeah. So this idiot signs us for 15 dates at one, at $1,500 a show. $1,500, now dig this. At that time, Run DMC's getting 60, Houdini's getting 30, and LL's getting 15, and they giving us 1,500. And that ain't, we have to pay for room and board, transportation, and all that with that. When we got back after 15 days and we divided all the money after all the costs, we all got about $1,500 a piece. That was whack. That was whack. So we back now and we feuding because I believe that we deserve more than what we're getting. And I'm getting the pushback from my guys. Oh, you got the big head and your ego is starting to take off. All right, cool. I don't really want to do this anyway. Let's just... Do whatever it is. Natty Prep seems to understand what he's doing, Charles Douglas. So we get invited to play at Great America. They want us to open for Jermaine Jackson. So we get there, and I ask, what are we getting paid? And they tell me the number, and after talking with Charles and understanding how the business work and how we have this big song and we're bigger than, I ask that everybody get 1000 that's not, because I think the first thing was pissed out, well, we can give, no, they weren't trying to give anybody more than anybody, but I was like, we need more than $1,000 between the five of us. So why not, not just give us each $1,000? If you're paying Jermaine 10, you can give us five. I mean, we have the number one song. That was the breaking point. Them niggas was not wanting to hear that. It was like, oh, you, you natty prep in your ear, and you, you the big shot, and... They never really understood. They never respected what, what it was. And it was sad because Marcus wrote the lyrics. So it was his baby, but he never felt pride enough to really stand up for that. Because in the beginning, it was Marcus who was supposed to be going to take the paperwork from Dave Lucchese to the lawyer. That's what he said. But he didn't do that. So when we get back with Dave Lucchese and Marcus is there, ready to sign, we assumed it was all good. And it wasn't. We signed away our publishing. We'll, we'll never get that back. We still got writers, and that generates nice money since the 80s. It's been good. The Rumors is a big song, and they use it a lot in different places. But it's not what Dave Lucchese got to put his daughters through college, take care of his daughter, Danica and Dania. Yeah. Mm -hmm.